Art of Physica, uh, which is a Berlin-based intermediate dance collective, and we've been making work since 2012. Over this period, we did several collaborative efforts to build interactive performance experiences between mediums, including 4D sound, animated and creative coded visuals, and choreographies with sensors on the body to affect sound and visuals. If you want to know more about those works, you can visit our website in the link I will paste into the Telegram chat. Um, but we're here tonight to talk about uh, the current work we're building and researching, titled Human ID, which is coming from questions about human identity and technologies like AR, AI, and the ability to deepfake a personality. About what is that thing that makes us human and why is it we feel so threatened if it could be overwritten? Um, from my side, these questions began a couple of years ago when I started to teach myself coding and uh, wondering if I could take some of the syntax and put it on bodies and choreographies. And at that time, uh, Daria and I, we were making a lot of loops of choreographies, so I thought it would be fun to do something simple like dot pop or dot push and just play around with the phrasings there. Um, uh, so it started out in a, a playful way, but uh, soon bigger questions emerged. Um, I, I became fascinated with this idea of uh, being able to look at the code behind a project like a website and you can clearly see like what is functioning, how it looks and so on. And I started to wonder, well, what is the code behind the human? which is not as uh, easy an answer to, um, to discover or to even peek in on. Um, but we started with a simple outline. So uh, thinking of the human as a shell that runs uh, scripts or programs, and, um, and then this bigger que question of, could we take uh, one performer or shell and um, exchange the script from the other and erase the original copy or erase um, the the personality uh, of the other before our very eyes. In other words, is it possible to produce a live deep fake in performance? Um, since those questions emerge, I've been lucky to research and and try to test these uh, yeah research. Uh, from these questions through the support of uh, the Combustible Residency that we're currently um, being hosted by Counterpulse in San Francisco until April of next year, um, and in collaboration with Alessandra Leone, who is a co-founding member of Stratophysica and does the visual content, the video and lighting, as well as collaborations in sensor building um, but unfortunately could not join us tonight. The two collaborators that are present uh, is Daria Kaufman, who is a longtime partner in crime uh, in making thoughtful, intricate choreographies, dance, and um, is kind enough to have shared a stage with me over the last 10 years or so, or more. <laughs> Um, and I would say the one asking a lot of relevant probing questions to to help mine the meaning of the works, uh, as well as Ian Heisters, uh, who is a new media artist uh, working with dance and installation and is the AI researcher for this project. And I will also post links of their work, their websites um, in the chat. But without further ado, I'm going to let them talk about um, their parts of the research for this work. Daria. So actually, before I talk, um, I just wanted to show some movement studies that I've created in as part of Human ID. Just take a couple of minutes to show these short choreographies that I call um, glitch studies. And there's no sound for this, just so you know.
So those are just a few short choreographies that um, I've been developing that I call glitch studies. And let's talk about their relevance to the project now. Um, I mean, I feel like in general, we're looking at how individuals' appearance, their body language, their mannerisms are mediated through uh, video technology. And like so many of us in the world right now, I'm spending so much time on video calls, um, interacting with people so much that way. And over the past months, there are all these moments when I'm on a video call with someone where it just like freezes on their face. And um, it's like this strangely intimate and voyeuristic moment. I don't know that they know that they're frozen. I also don't know if I'm frozen or not. And I'm just like staring at them in this kind of punishingly um, naked moment. And it's like simultaneously painful, but I, I can't really look away. Um, and I've just been thinking about that and that this is how so many of us are interacting now, that this is just our, our new normal. Um, and so those are like the freeze moments that I find just actually really powerful and kind of um, poetic in of themselves. Um, and then also the, the glitches where, you know, there's just like this kind of stuck in place back and forth. Um, I've always been interested in glitch in video art and sound art. And I feel like there's this, there's some sort of opportunity for transformation in the glitch for what the thing that is glitching, the glitch is like a vehicle for it to transcend whatever it is. Um, so I've always been interested in that. And right now I feel like, again, through video calls, I'm being confronted by this this glitch phenomenon quite a bit. And I, and I also feel like it just has greater relevance in the world right now because, um, I mean, the whole world is sort of glitching right now. Um, we're all stuck in place. We're not able to move forward or back. And we're just, uh, um, but we need to move, you know? So um, this is all what's been inspiring these studies. Um, and and yeah, it's related that in terms of human ID, I feel like something we're we're, we're creating this entire project through video, um, which none of us have ever done before. I mean, we're working remotely at it. Like, never have all four of us been in the same place. Um, and it's just going to continue to be like this for a while. And um, it's like a whole other way to create. And it's interesting because this, it's become like the process of this remoteness and this um, everything being mediated, mediated by video has become the subject of the piece, I feel, is like, how do we actually, how our identity is mediated by video technologies um, filtered by them. So yeah, that's something, uh, that's a little bit of my personal thread and I guess there, I'll just pass it on to Ian. Um, hi, I'm Ian. Um, yeah, so picking up from what there is, um, like the, the running this entire project through various video networking devices, um, one of the things I've been starting to think about is how the, um, because we've been so we've been working with these neural networks um, and doing some research around how we can build it into the piece to create certain deep fakes um, and thinking about how a neural network can learn an identity of a person um, and if there's any um, valence of of who that person actually is learned by the network. And for me, there's this question of whether the the non neural networks, but the networks that are connecting us now, you know, the Google and the Facebook and the Zoom are while we're working on this project are learning something about the identity of the project itself in this like kind of lower tech, less obvious way. Um, some of the, the deep learning stuff we've been working on, let me share my screen here. Um, 
Okay, y'all see this. Um, one of the initial things that we started talking about was, um, so that the piece is very much about identity um, and how identity is expressed through movement and how um, a neural network can be uh, interposed into that relationship um, to start fucking with that relationship. Um, so we, <clears throat> we researched uh, this deep learning technique um, called motion transfer. Um, this is some of the early research. This is based on a paper out of Berkeley called uh, UC Berkeley here in California um, called Everybody Dance Now. Um, but this applied to obviously Daria is here along the top and has along here on the bottom. And so what we do is um, we take a bunch of frames of video um, of say Daria dancing um, and we run uh, pose estimation on that, that like reduces her uh, body position to a set of labels about where her different body parts are. Um, we train a neural network on a performance of hens that learns the visual style of her, what she looks like um, visually. Um, and then we can apply the structure that we pulled out of Daria's performance and apply it to hens visual representation. And we end up with down here on the bottom, we end up with a synthesized image of hen, hen's image performing Daria's movement. Um, this one's a little bit buggy. You see like her shadows get picked up by the neural network as part of her body because the shadows look so much like a body. Um, but it, it provides this opportunity for like the kind of this weird puppeteering and this weird uh, amalgamation of their identities um, as expressed through, um, through their bodies and then through the camera. Like the camera becomes a really important player in this um, and it brings up a lot about how you're filming it and um, both technically and in terms of uh, cinema. Um, so let me show this. So, um, so then based on that outline, we can take a video like this of Hen performing a movement. And then we train a model on Daria's visual representation and we can get Daria. This is very buggy still, we're testing, experimenting, um, performing the same movement, uh, even though she never performed this dance. Uh, so let's put these side by side. And we'll restart them just so you can see the synchronicities. Um, so obviously like there's errors in um, what the neural network learns about Daria's identity and her visual representation. Um, and it seems to get especially screwed up around the face. I think it mixes up, it's learned a lot about her hair, um, but is a little bit confused about what's hair and what's face. Um, so it kind of like, you, if you look closely, you can see some upside down, down eyeballs in her face and like, it's just like all just contorted. Uh, that's something we might address or it's something we might leave in the piece. Um, but it's also, it's strange watching these videos when you're making them and seeing yourself, like what you recognize as yourself. Oh, that's me, that's Daria. And I, but there's a video of me doing something that I never actually did. Um, it creates this weird dissonance. Um, so coming back to, I just wanted to share some of the research we've done around this. The original paper that we're working off of um, does this skeleton-based structural analysis of the body. Um, I started playing around with doing, um, there's another technique um, that was developed by Facebook actually called dense pose. 
Um, and what you see here, so under this is a, there's a video of Hen, um, just from the shoulders up. Um, and Den's pose, um, instead of just marking out the basic structure, like here's the head, like just these two little dots in a line, um, it actually creates like a silhouette or a mask. Um, and then we can also lay over eyebrows, nose. Um, and this becomes really helpful for different kinds of video. Like um, the skeleton-based analysis is really, um, it has to have the full body in view. Um, and like when it loses a limb, it starts to freak out. And so it creates a lot of limitations in terms of what you can do cinematically. Um, and when we start working with dense pose, it opens up. The some of the frames we can do. It still has a lot of limitations. Um, but for instance, we can do a shoulders up shot, a medium close up like this. Um, and then we can do a, sort of a portrait transfer. I'm standing in here because I couldn't get a video from Daria. Um, we can do a portrait transfer. Um, this has other shortcomings, uh, for instance, because so the dense pose, instead of creating a skeleton, it creates like a full outline of the body. You end up with this, again, this amalgamation of bodies where like <laughs> it ends up with my face, facial shape, including my beard, because it doesn't understand how to segment a beard from a body. Um, but then it's like hen's appearance on my outline or my body type. Um, um, and obviously there's some strange glitches around the mouth, probably also due to my beard. It always throws off these kinds of um, computer vision analyses. Um, but there's something about a portrait that I've been interested in on this project because like the portrait is this photographic analog of a lot of the things we're talking about in terms of capturing an identity um, or finding an identity photographically um, or cinematically. Um, but um, I've also been playing around with some like unintended mappings um, kind of leaning into the, the space where things start to screw up and, and you can start to see the edges instead of going for this like hyper-realistic deep fake that you could use for propaganda, you know, like, oh, here's Vladimir Putin th saying things he would never say or Barack Obama. Um, how can we actually go the other direction and find the edges of the algorithms and where they screw up? And because then you can kind of get, um, uh, a perspective into what's actually happening um, and what it's actually doing. So here's some experiments I did with mapping um, my hand to my face. Um, and so the, the neural network is learning. Um, you're basically telling it like this hand equals this face. And you do that um, tens of thousands of times. And it's able to resolve um, and then when I show it a different hand in a similar position, um, it's able to say, oh, okay, that's this face. And the, the face you see on the right, uh, well, the face you see, I hope it's on your right, um, is completely synthesized. Um, but it maintains a lot of the, um, the details of the original um, photography or cinematography. Um, but then you can also start to see these weird artifacts of the algorithm, um, both in terms of like this cross hatching that you see on the beard. Um, sometimes it resolves really clearly and you're like, oh, that's a photograph of a person. Um, and then sometimes it almost, you see more of the hand. Um, Um, and so in 
working on this, like one of the things I'm interested in exploring is um, like, what is the algorithm actually learning about me? Um, is there, is it learning anything about my identity? Um, hold on one second, Let this go away. Um, is it actually learning anything about my identity? Is there some kind of vectorized representation of my identity in the same way that a photograph, <clears throat> we can say captures some dead moment of somebody, some little slice of their identity, you can see it shine through and that's legible to you. Um, is there some sort of, you know, n-dimensional representation of that person in the network um, that's left behind? Um, is this a way of, of maintaining a memory of a person? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I think that wraps it up for what I have to say. Thanks, guys. Um, so we have with us today um, Chris Harris and Miriam Simon, and I will um, love to invite them to introduce themselves. Sure, I'm happy to go first. Um, thanks, Hen. Thanks, Ian and Daria. That was interesting to, to see what you've been working on there. Um, yeah, my name's Chris. I have had historically quite a technical background. I studied AI quite a long time ago. And long story short, became quite, although, although I started studying AI because I was fascinated by human data and human computer interaction and biomimicry. I became quite disillusioned with a lot of the uses of the technology. Um, and indeed, there's a lot of critique um, about the way we currently approach AI from, you know, the direction of which we approach it, mimicking or rather taking the human intelligence as the apex of intelligence and trying to mimic that or, or using it to subvert our own intelligence. So, I appreciate the um, investigation that you have done into where things break down, and um, you know, using this as a as a critical investigation into the scope of our relationship with identity and how much a machine can or or cannot learn. Um, yeah, so. Um, yeah, I'll let Miriam also uh, say a few words about herself, who I also know is a, a very interesting um, HCI practitioner. Miriam. Thanks. Um, my name is Miriam Simoon. I'm an artist. I also actually, yeah, I do do user experience design. So I think a lot about how humans interact with machines. Uh, and just broadly, I'm, uh, as an artist, interested in the uh, social and po poetic and political and weird implications of new technologies and bodies. So yeah, really uh, excited actually about all, all of your, everything you guys said. Cool. Um, Daria, I had a couple of comments on your rather observations on the, the, um, the glitch studies that you showed that I, that I really liked. What I, what if I, I mean, you mentioned the time we spend on Zoom and the Zoom fatigue uh, we get. And I feel like a lot of that is because of the lack of feedback we get in a virtual capacity as opposed to in a physical capacity. And, and you mentioned the, the role of technology in mediating and indeed in reducing that bandwidth we have between each other. Um, and what I felt, what I really saw in, in your glitch performances was this asymmetry of perspective. Um, I think we always, to some degree, have an asymmetry of perspective, even when we're one human talking to another human, albeit our context very much grounds us in some kind of um, mimicking of, of, of where we are. But when we're so distant, I feel like the, the symmetry of perspective is, is, is so, um, yeah, there's so much dissonance there between what I see and what the other person sees. Um, and especially when things break down and and start to glitch out and you become this voyeur in this slice of reality. <laughs> like, you, like you mentioned, this is almost, um, almost punishing voyeurism that you can't quite look away from. Um, I think we're constantly fascinated by what um, 
is quite an unconventional viewpoint of a normally conventional scenario. Um, so yeah, I appreciated your your studies um, there at some point. Mm. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I just interrupted. Okay. Uh, part of the the Zoom beauties. Um, uh, I'm just so I recent. I was just like, well, okay. There's a lot. Uh, but I'm going to ask like the last question I had first, cause it's kind of a really big one. Um, so one of the last things Ian said, but also kind of what all of you guys were talking about, like, what is the algorithm learning about me? Is it really learning about my identity? Then there's this question I would pose, but I'm not, uh, about what Hen was starting with around like, um, personality getting put in another shell, but then like personality here is equated to movement which I get, but also that's like a big thing to talk about. Um, but then I just recently was listening to like Susan Sontag talking, right? And the whole thing of like taking a photo and what the photographer uh, takes from reality, takes from that moment, takes from the subject. And this is just a still, a still photo that, that you're printing, right? And so then it really like kind of exploded my mind of everything you guys are doing because what is yeah like what are you taking um oh uh, yeah so that's my first question <laughs> it's kind of a huge one but how like because also i guess because you guys have started doing this and i actually see it a bit more like mm, you guys are finding really the beautiful part and where like where the machine gives you more rather than takes away uh, than like a human to human. Um, but I do wonder like having done this process, like, um, yeah, like what is it taking from you or what are you taking from each other or yeah. I can speak to that a little bit. Um, there's a lot in there. Well, I guess I'll say that um, I'll try to focus on two different threads. One is like the, I wanted to mention that like earlier on in our process, Ian introduced us to um, Miriam Boim. Is that her name, Ian? Um, Svetlana Boim. Svetlana Boim, thank you. Miriam and her um, who like uh, writes about nostalgic technology and and finding the humanity in the flaws and the errors going towards the errors um and I feel like that's kind of become a touchstone like that was really useful for me to read and it, it keeps returning this wanting to look at the flaws and the errors if the air is human then you want to find the human in the machine you go towards the mistake um and I think that's kind of and I yeah so that's been a kind of touchstone for the project and then something else you were saying Miriam another thread towards the end I've lost it though um about taking the uh, interested in this taking like what are you uh, going yeah taking? yeah I think like what is being captured it doesn't even belong to me the thing that's being captured, um, where where does it lie? You know, um, I think that's a really interesting question, and I understand people feeling so threatened by these technologies and the notion that someone can take your image and make it do anything you want, and then that gets described as and and this violation but the thing is the thing that's being taken it's you and it's not you it's the, it's the representation of you um so i think it's just the territory right now and i'll leave it at that i'm, I'm kind of surprised to hear you say that you like that we're creating all this beauty um because I, I think like what it's taking is so obvious to me in these like these strange 
like neural pastiches of different body parts in this like strange like I mean it's like it's it's grotesque um uh and I think I mean where the beauty does come through is uh it was something in the the solar punk like manifesto for this event of um like imagining new possibilities for our relationships to technology and that that is in there and that's like also from the Svetlana Boim she talks about it in terms of a nostalgia for like a um a, a future or even a present that isn't not like is a parallel present to the current she calls it the off modern so we have our, our modern the the um dominant modern ideology that ai is going to save us and it's also all going to put put us all out of jobs and elon musk is you know creating this this modern notion of ai i mean and i'm using him as a stand-in for a lot of people um but then um, there's an imagination or a nostalgia for this other possibility we had where technology was built for, um, for these kinds of interrogations that we're doing for creativity and for um, thoughtfulness and for beauty. Um, and part of what we're doing is, is, I mean, the tools that I'm using are, were built for like um, automated driving. Like a lot of it was built to train cars on how to drive. Um, and so you, we're, we're taking these like high grade industrial tools and, and hacking them so that we can turn, we can create this um, other possibility for an application of technology that is a little more introspective. Um, I don't think that answers any questions though. But are you trading, like, this is my question. Are you trading the, or what because you are uh, the thing i find beautiful is like uh all these yeah like the the piece daria made and and all of the weird glitches and you the the hand inside your face like all this crazy beautiful to me stuff that is in the air blah 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 but like what are you trading for that that's i guess my yeah question. that's a good question hmm. i wanted to just maybe follow on from that a little bit and extend that into the question that i had that from especially when Ian, you were showing the um, puppeted movement and the fact that the machine was seeing into different parts and projecting more human there, perhaps. What I was re really, you know, what really hit me there is the bias of identity that we have, because, you know, we as, as humans have a bias of what constitutes as our identity, and the machine now has a bias towards what constitutes as, as identity based on, on what is trained there. And I think bias is right there because no two are necessarily correct. I mean, what what is our identity, um, and what is and what isn't? What is the environment? What what is the machine right to project a human into the side of the wall? Um, so the, the question that I wanted to that, that led up to for me was asking you, as um, artists and practitioners doing this work, whether you've had any shifts of identity or um, whether you've grappled with this or, or if there's been any anything um, that's kind of come to mind in in that way that's that's changed or that you have new considerations after doing this for me personally um this project like uh, it's been just very extended because of COVID and just working this way, working through technology so much. Um, I think it's, it's like if you're interacting with someone, there's you and there's them, and then there's the thing that is emerging between you. And I feel like in some ways the technology, that space between is bigger. Um, so it has, there's like, uh, because there's more of a disconnect, there's also more potential for something to arise in between. Um, and I'm just be, like in our process, for instance, for a while, I was like really frustrated. I was like wanting to hold it and know what it is and like be able to frame it neatly and I kept coming up with a frame, like, it's this. And then we would get on a call together and, uh, never mind, it's not that. So then, okay, now it's this. And, uh, 
like this constant back and forth between being with them virtually and then being on my own and all these the storytelling that goes on and I have my own storytelling that I do on my own and then I have to try and reconcile it with them on these virtual calls and it was just getting exhausting so eventually I just kind of let go and was like okay the story is just it's emerging and I need to not try to have so much control over it stop trying to hold it area just like let it be what it is and let it ping pong is something that we've a structure that we've landed on um let it ping pong and each time the ball comes back it's a little different and that's okay and I don't have to hold it Neatly. Did that make any sense? Yeah, that was that, that was beautiful. Yeah, thank you very much, Daria. Like the identity okay. is created in the spaces in between, and and just you know. to let it be, and to not be afraid of that, and to know that that can happen, and I can still be me. That mm. I'm porous, and that's okay. Mm, brilliant words to end on. I think that's about all we have time for. So thank you very much, Daria, Ian, Henny, and Miriam. Um, pleasure to speak with you all. Thank you, Chris and Miriam. Thank you. Thanks.